Welcome back to the 14 Jaipur Literature Festival. From here, we are at Diggy Palace at the front lawn, protected by Dettol. Today's session is presented with media partner Business Standard. It's our pleasure to present The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good. Michael Sandel in conversation with Shashi Tharoor. These are dangerous times for democracy. In his new book, The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good, renowned philosopher Michael Sandel shows how the polarized politics of our times reflects the deep divide between winners and losers. He argues that we must rethink the attitudes towards success and failure that have accompanied globalization and rising inequality. In conversation with celebrated author and member of parliament, Shashi Tharoor, Sandal offers an ethic of dignity and solidarity that points the way to a new politics of the common good. Michael Sandel teaches political philosophy at Harvard University. His books, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets and Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do, were international bestsellers and have been translated into over 27 languages. His BBC series, The Global Philosopher, explores the ethical issues lying behind the headlines with participants from around the world. Sandel's new book is The Tyranny of Merit, What Becomes of the Common Good? with the New York Times Book Review describing it as required reading for all in a polarized age. Shashi Tharoor is author, politician, former international civil servant, and currently a third term Lok Sabha member of parliament, representing the Thiruvananthapuram constituency in India's lower house of parliament. He currently chairs the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Information Technology. During his nearly three decade long prior career at the United Nations, he served as a peacekeeper, refugee worker, and administrator at the highest levels, serving as Under Secretary General during Kofi Annan's leadership of the organization. He is also an award winning author of over 20 books of fiction, as well as non fiction, including The Great Indian Novel, The Paradoxical Prime Minister, The Hindu Way, and The New World Disorder. Dr. Tharu's 22nd book is titled The Battle of Belonging. Please do remember to comment by typing it into the comment section below. Ladies and gentlemen, the tyranny of merit. What's become of the common good? Michael Sandel in conversation with Shashi Tharoor. I'm just delighted uh, to be reunited with my old friend Michael Sandel uh, at the Jaipur Literary Festival. I wish it could have been in person, uh, but we are doing this remotely. Uh, Michael and I, uh, saw a fair bit of each other in the 1990s, uh, particularly when we co-conducted a seminar at the Aspen Institute in Colorado and, um, and haven't seen each other for an age, but I have been following his wonderful writing. Uh, I should tell you all that Michael really is a, a rock star. He teaches one of the largest and most popular courses at Harvard, a course called Justice. Uh, he, he has uh, uh, a great, uh, serious global profile as an academic, but he's also an astonishingly well-known academic. His first book, Liberalism and the Limits of Justice, going back to 1982, criticized the influential philosopher John Rawls, who suggested um, a conception of the individual that, uh, that Michael thought was too atomized and unrealistic. Then he's written a wonderful collection of essays, Public Philosophy, essay, Essays on Morality, in politics, and of course, his book, What Money Can't Buy, which Kritika mentioned, that came out uh, just eight years ago on the moral limits of markets, has essentially sealed his status as a formidable critic of free market orthodoxy in, in Western thinking. And now, the new book, which has just been released in India, has been out in the West for a few months, The Tyranny of Merit, uh, which argues for a politics centered on dignity, and says essentially that pursuing meritocracy has betrayed in many ways uh, the world's uh, working classes. Now, I, I, I want to turn to Michael. I have lots and lots of questions. I have to say, Michael, this book shook some of my most fundamental assumptions. And I, I'm going to start challenging you on them so that you can explicate your thesis through perhaps my devil's advocacy. Yes, but, of course. But, but, but my argument here is, uh, because I came very much to the idea of meritocracy because 
we are a relatively unequal and hierarchical society in India. And um, uh, I find that the one saving grace uh, that we have, a way of pulling ourselves out from the disabilities of either caste or region or language or religion is something called meritocracy, passing an examination with better marks than somebody else, uh, scoring a higher rank than somebody else, somebody who may have started off with more privileges and advantages than you. Uh, meritocracy taught us that it was actually a progressive ideal. It helped people to bust through barriers of things like caste, um, uh, things like money, uh, to go as far as their talents and efforts would take them. Uh, and, and so it helped you rise above the prejudice and discrimination that structured society. Now you've argued meritocracy is not an alternative to inequality, it's a justification for inequality. And that really shakes me because I've always thought that, um, that you know, um, uh, studying hard, working hard, getting results um, uh, was the way forward. You're dismissing that as the rhetoric of rising. Now tell me what's so wrong with the meritocracy that I was brought up to respect. Right. And which, well, by the way, I would like to think is the only explanation for whatever I've achieved in life. But go ahead. Well, thank you, Shashi, both for the warm and generous words of introduction and for the bracing challenge, which is exactly the right challenge. So let me see if I can try to reply to it. But you'll push back, I hope, and tell me if if you find this unpersuasive. Meritocracy does surely seem a progressive ideal, especially against the background of aristocratic privilege, caste societies, prejudice, holding people back, not enabling everyone to compete fairly, to advance, to achieve, to succeed. That's certainly true. And yet, there's a dark side to meritocracy. That's what I mean by the tyranny of merit. And the dark side has become increasingly evident and dangerous today. And let me see if I can try to explain why, and then you'll tell me whether you find this convincing, Shashi. Mm -hmm. In recent decades, during the past four decades of market-driven globalization, the divide between winners and losers has been deepening, poisoning our politics, driving us apart. This has partly to do with the growing inequalities of income and wealth, but it's not only that. It's also to do with changing attitudes toward winning and losing, changing attitudes toward success. In recent decades, those who've landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing, the measure of their merit, and by implication, that those left behind, those who struggle, have no one to blame but themselves. Now, this reflects the meritocratic ideal, what I describe, as you point out, the rhetoric of rising. The response by elites over the past four decades to the deepening inequality brought about by globalization, has been to tell people, you can make it if you try. If you want to compete and win in the global economy, go to university. What you earn will depend on what you learn. Now, this is inspiring in one way, for just the reasons that you point out, Shashi. It's inspiring because it says to everyone, You're, you are responsible if chances are equal, you are responsible for whether you rise or whether you don't. It's inspiring. Pull yourself up, lift yourself up, get a university education. The dark side is that it leads, uh, well, the dark side in broad terms is it's corrosive of the common good, of solidarity, because if I really believe that my success is my own doing. I must also believe that those left behind are responsible for their troubles. And 
it leads me to forget the luck and good fortune that help all of us on can, our Can, can I interrupt there? Because I, please, I, please. I, know you, I know you have a more complex argument coming. But on that one, I, I don't think it necessarily follows. I think many of us uh -huh. uh, in, in Indian politics today, for example, who, yeah. have, who have found ourselves in positions of influence and authority right. are passionate about recognizing the disabilities that lay other people low, disabilities of right. caste, of religion, of region, right. of language, etc., right. and are determined to promote a politics that gives these people a fairer chance. Now, at the same time, we're not knocking meritocracy because meritocracy is what put us in a position to help them, uh, right. or to fight for their rights. But right. I, I, I don't think it necessarily follows that every right. meritocrat says, well, if you don't have what I have, you deserve what you've got. No, I, I, I think that in many ways, uh, uh, meritocracy is about your achievement, but what you choose to believe and what you choose to do with your achievements will still vary from one uh, meritocrat to another. Uh, you don't have to justify your success by putting down somebody else. Uh, you don't have to say that I will look down on those who haven't reached where I am because they haven't made the same effort. They haven't made, you know, the same, they haven't got the same talent or they haven't passed the same exams. Well, look, I may realize if come from a poor home, they didn't have electricity. They were studying under a street lamp when they wrote the same exam I wrote. Um, uh, and maybe, you know, their, their parents didn't have money to put them uh, in college, even though college in India is hugely subsidized and it's not that expensive. But even then, maybe they didn't, even, didn't have that. So I always personally have felt that a sense of common responsibility is for sense of society is there. But that doesn't make me any less convinced that right. the only reason I am where I am is I worked very hard to get here. You see what I'm saying? Right. That, I, right. I'm not sure you're being fair to, 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 to dismiss everyone who's risen through meritocracy as necessarily contemptuous of those who haven't risen. Oh, well, I certainly agree that everyone who has, written, uh, who has risen through meritocracy is not contemptuous of those who struggle, of course. And I think you put it well that, that many meritocrats, many who succeed, who rise through the meritocracy do have a generous, and socially committed stance toward creating a truly level playing field for everybody else. And you're an exemplar of this, Shashi. So far be it from me to deny that this is a possibility. You're right when you say it doesn't necessarily follow. But I would have two replies. First, I'm describing broad tendencies mm -hmm. in the social and political life of societies that are market-driven meritocracies, and we can come to that, broad tendency. But there's something else that has to do more with the ideal itself. What should be the project for helping those who struggle, who left behind, who may have been struggling under a lamp, as you say, to study and couldn't really prepare to compete effectively in the exams that would enable them to win a place in a university? Well, one response is to say, let's level the playing field. Let's give everyone fair equality of opportunity so that everyone can compete with, without regard to the disadvantages or advantages of birth or of class or of caste or of upbringing. That's one project. And that's a worthy and important and a noble project, creating truly equal opportunity. But what I'm suggesting is that that principle, important though it is, is a remedial principle. We could achieve a society, and it, well, here's, here's a question I would put back to you. Suppose, Shashi, that we could create a society with truly fair equality of opportunity. Overcoming, we've got a long way to go, but overcoming all of the barriers and obstacles that hold some people back. Would that be, if we could achieve it, a just society? And would it be a good society? What would you say? Well, equality of opportunity is, is certainly, uh, it's an ideal. Uh, we all strive towards an ideal. Right. Um, at the same time, in India, we have recognized that sometimes it's not enough and you also need some uh, protection of outcomes. For example, we have the so-called untouchable, the Dalit community, which right. has suffered 3,000 years of discrimination. Right. So for them, 
there are guaranteed reserve seats in universities, in, in government jobs, even in parliament, to which only they, people from that community, uh, can be appointed or elected. So that even if you've given them equality of opportunity or recognizing, they may not get the same results in the same exams as somebody uh, like Michael Sandel. So Michael, not being a Dalit, has to get a higher grade to be qualified for the same job that the Dalit must. So All right, equality, of opportunity, still... equality of opportunity is a large part of it, but equality or rather not equality, inequality of outcome is also built into a, a morally just system in our conception. Now, there are people who don't, disagree, who don't agree with this, but it's built into our constitution. Right. No, I agree with reservations or, in the, or affirmative action, but that still is in the name of removing barriers or compensating for barriers to right. achievement. So suppose we had such a system in place, uh, would that be a just society, do you think? Or would it be an insufficient ideal? That's the question the book really drives at, and I'd like to know what you think. Okay, I, I wanted to lead towards that because I have read the book, so I know where you end up and I want to take our conversation there. But let, okay, me, continue, go ahead. let, let me continue pushing back actually okay. a couple of things. One of the things that you are very critical of, and I've, I've seen this uh, in, in various places in the book, is the whole globalization business. Uh, you think that, and I, I don't frankly disagree with you that much, uh, that, that, that globalization um, essentially lets a lot of people, our mutual friend Tom Friedman was a, was a cheerleader for this, that, you know, forget uh, the world is now flat, forget right and left, what really matters is open and closed. Um, and we need open societies and so on. And that in that cheerleading for globalization, uh, we left out uh, a whole lot of people in every society. Right. Uh, and, and there, I don't disagree with you. But the problem is that when you then look at um, the, um, uh, the examples you use, for example, the, the obscene amounts of money made by hedge fund managers, out of all proportion to their contribution or the contribution of of the work they do, even to the economy, let alone to society. Right. Um, one could argue that you can be for merit and yet against that kind of disproportionate reward. I, I can agree with you, Michael, that's obscene. That shouldn't be about to happen. But I don't think that's about merit. That's about a smart, if you like, the smarts involved in gaming the system um, uh, rather than uh, an objectively verified merit. It's not the kid who is better at maths who's made the million dollar bonus. It's not even the kid who, who got the A grade at university who's, who's made the million dollar bonus. It's somebody who essentially played with numbers and, and, and made that money and could as easily have lost that money. So again, it seems to me that you are shooting at a few targets which deserve to be shot at, but which are not entirely, to my mind, typical of what most of us would understand by meritocracy. Uh, because I'm not even sure that a hedge fund manager is where he is because of meritocracy. He might well be there because he got the right university degree on his CV because he was a legacy student, admitted because his father and grandfather had been to the same Ivy League university. And that's why he got taken into this, into this elite Wall Street firm and got in a position to make millions. So he right. may not actually be emblematic of the meritocracy you're criticizing. Okay, well, this raises two what I take to be two problems with meritocracy. One, which I know you're sympathetic to, is that in many aspects of life in the economy, we don't live up to the meritocratic ideals we profess. In the scenario you described about the hedge fund manager who had all kinds of advantages would be a case in point. Another would be this. Despite generous financial aid policies at the American Ivy League universities, still there are more students in these places from the top 1% than from the entire bottom half of the country combined. So these are examples of the problem with meritocracy being that there's not enough of it. It's not thoroughgoing enough. We don't live up to it. But I'm suggesting that even if we did, there would be a problem because the ideal is flawed. What's flawed is not the idea that people should be well qualified for jobs. That's merit in a good sense. If I need surgery, I want a very good surgeon to perform it, of course. But meritocracy makes a further claim. And that claim is 
that insofar as chances are equal, and of course they aren't in practice, but insofar as they are, the winners deserve their winnings. And it's this that leads to hubris among the winners and to demoralization, even humiliation among the losers. One of the most potent sources of the populist backlash, the authoritarian populist backlash against elites is the sense that elites are looking down on large swaths of the population. And what I suggest is certainly in many Western democracies, you can tell me whether this is true or not of authoritarian populism in India, but in Western countries, this grievance is legitimate. It's legitimate because the elites across the political spectrum who fostered the market-driven or neoliberal globalization of the last four decades are the ones who benefited and believe that their success is their due because they earned it. And so it's the hubris among the successful and the humiliation among those left behind that has created, at least in Western democracies, the deep polarization that has opened the way to politicians like Trump. And that in large part is what inspired the book Shashi to give an account of why there is such rancor and anger, and I would say legitimate resentment among well, you know, many I, working people against elites. So I, I, I actually saw that coming. And in fact, I probably share your views on Trump entirely. And I, I see your ang anger, me. you're too nice a man to be angry, but I can see your rejection of the, of the way in which you feel that many of the so-called progressive politicians of the last 20 years, 25 years, have essentially hung the Western working class and its values sort of out to dry. But, but this is where I've come back. Think of yourself for a minute. You're an American at an Indian literary festival. Look at the Indian immigrants you know in America who have made it to the American dream, many of whom have flourished and succeeded beyond they would have been in anything that they could have widely dreamt of, even when growing up in India, who just got in because they did GREs or GMATs or whatever other examinations where they scored. There was nothing about their CV that an American admission committee could understand or relate to, but they had the marks that showed that they had something that many American students didn't have. They got in, they worked hard, they got the degrees, they got the jobs, the doctors, the engineers, the people of 40% of the Silicon Valley startups who uh, originated in India, the people who came from um, uh, really small towns in India and became doctors. Um, I mean, I know many of these people personally. One could argue that it is only meritocracy that enabled the bulk of immigrants to enjoy the fruits of the American dream. What would you say to them? That there's something wrong with the system that let them do that? No, I would say it's terrific what they've done and what they've achieved and the opportunity that system enabled, that's a great thing. The question is what has become to the society as a whole when in addition to allowing and, and, and encouraging that kind of opportunity, we build an ethic that persuades people not individuals. I'm not saying that everyone who succeeds partakes of the hubris I worry about, but that if we look across the society, the more the successful, we, you and me, Shashi, the more we believe, as I know you don't, that our success is our due, the harder it is to picture ourselves in other people's shoes, the easier it is to forget the luck and good fortune that helped us on our way. The easier it is to forget, to lose sight of our indebtedness to family, teachers, neighborhood, community, the times in which we live. And this I think has contributed to, I'm not saying there aren't well-intentioned, generous, progressive, conscientious, socially committed, successful meritocrats like Shashi Tharoor. Of course there are, but I'm talking about the shape of our political discourse and rhetoric. What should be the political project? 
Okay, I'll, 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 I'll come to that. Let me take you back to what you just said earlier, though, about yeah. the, West, the West and so on, because one, one could come back to the question of why there is such a backlash from the Western working class. Obviously, they've seen their jobs being sent off to Shanghai or even Bangalore. But is that only about the tyranny of merit? Aren't you no. overlooking, for example, racism, racial resentment at foreigners enjoying the fruits that, that, that Frankly, white American working class oh, yes, yes. One doesn't have economic anxiety that essentially is unrelated to merit. Are you overlooking that in your book, Michael? Oh, I don't think so. I think that there are that certainly a big part of Trump's appeal had to do with racism and xenophobia. There's no right. doubt about that. But if we say that's the only factor that has led the working class to vote for Trump, Whites without a college degree, two-thirds voted for Trump in 2016. Two-thirds voted for Trump, despite his disastrous presidency four years later, despite the fact that he did nothing uh, for them economically. He tried to take away their health care, yeah. and he had a huge tax cut for the wealthy. And yet two-thirds of whites without, white voters without a college degree voted for him. So, Which is why I think racial that, resentment had a lot to do with it. It did have a lot to do with it, but if the Democratic Party and if progressive politicians and people like us say that it's only about racism and xenophobia, which is certainly an important part of it. Look at the white supremacists who invaded the US Capitol. Of course, that's an element. But I think that we, that that, that diagnosis by itself is a recipe for complacence that is dangerous because it lets us, the meritocratic credential classes, the progressive politicians off the hook too easily for having prepared the way for Trump through deregulating finance, embracing a version of globalization that put a great premium on college education, telling people if you're worried about wage stagnation and job loss, just pull yourself up, get a university degree, then all will be well in a, in a society where most people don't have university degree, four-year university degree, even in the United States, even in Britain, even in Western Europe, the majority of people don't. So building a political agenda that says the solution to inequality is individual upward mobility through higher education, getting into a prestigious place, that's fine for those who can climb the ladder. That's fine for the people, the admirable people you described, immigrants who succeeded and rose. That's fine. And that's admirable. And that's a good thing. But it's not an adequate politics. And it's part of an attitude toward winning and losing. It creates a society of winners and losers that opens the way to figures like Trump including the, the racism and xenophobia. But that's not enough. That's not enough. And what essentially the progressive parties have done is they have become parties of the well-credentialed, well-educated, meritocratic, professional elites, and they have lost the support of most working people who traditionally were their base. It's true of the Democratic Party in the US, of the Labour Party in Britain, of the Social Democratic Parties in Europe. And they need to figure that out because otherwise, though Trump is gone, the danger of authoritarian populism is not. And so we can't let ourselves off the hook so easily as saying, well, as Hillary Clinton did, they're a basket of deplorables. There's no way we can reach them. They're hopelessly racist and xenophobic, even though that's a big part of Trump's appeal and, and, and of Marine Le Pen's appeal and of UKIP's appeal and, and so on. We can't let ourselves off the hook, Shashi, that easily because we actually, our complacence opened the way for figures like Trump. Fair enough. Now I'll lead you to, your, to your, the thrust of your conclusion because obviously this begs the question amongst those listening to our conversation, well, okay, so we agree with Michael's diagnosis. How do we act on it? What's the prescription for constructing a fairer society? Now, if I've understood you right, you, you anchor your prescription essentially um, in your analysis that says that meritocracy 
essentially banishes the capacity of people to see themselves as sharing a common fate. And the yeah. answer to that is we have to forge solidarity. Uh, what makes merit tyrannical is that it's all about an individual success and not about the collective common good. And right. so you're saying let's focus on the dignity of work. Let's let's help people to leave to lead dignified lives. Let's let's uh, move away from the politics of market faith and globalization into right. one of community and national identity. But that, first of all, I, I, I'm not sure I fairly summarized your view, so I should let you answer the question. Is that a fair, um, I mean, I, I got your point about moving away from a society of winners and losers. Is that right. a fair conclusion? Because that will lead to my next question once you've explained. Uh, yes, the, except, for the, except for the last sentence, it's a, it's a very good uh, account that we should focus less on arming people for meritocratic combat and focus more on the dignity of work, on making life decent and work dignified for everyone, whether they are credentialed with a university degree or not. The only, the only part of your very good summary I would hesitate a bit was the point about national identity, which is a complicated thing. But the rest of it, yes. And, and moving broadly from meritocratic competition to what I would call not equality of outcome, not the idea that everyone must have the same income and wealth, but a broad democratic equality of condition where we build within civil society institutions for class mixing, for people to engage one another from different walks of life, different backgrounds of class and race and ethnicity and caste, so that we come to forge, to form a sense that we, we are in this together, that we share a common life. And part of that, part of that sharing will be national, a sense of national pride. But I don't want to, to, to lay exclusive stress as, as you seem to, on national identity, because identitarianism, I mean, that, as we've seen, that is a, a very much a mixed bag at best. Well, but my, my last sense book, of a common uh, life, yes. My, Go my ahead, last book, Actually, my last book is an attack on, on identity politics and nationalism versus the civic nationalism that I have celebrated in America and seek to celebrate yeah. in India, but which is very yes. much under threat in India today. I but understand. Speak, I'm with you. I'm with you, you on that, Shashi. But when you I, speak I agree. Of, of, of a sense of belonging and community, um, yeah. that can only be understood in the context of a society and a society, unfortunately, usually it's constructed within national borders. That's why I use the word national and not with a great deal of excitement because obviously I'm worried that national uh, identity could create more of the same Trumpists who want to see yes. the dawn yeah. back in power. Right, right. So I, I'm with you on that. I want the, if you've, if you've called it the civic, civic sense of, of community and nation rather than the identitarian idea of nationalism, which leads quickly to xenophobia and intolerance. So that's, so I, I think we're together on that, uh, Shash. But l let me push back for one last time because thereafter I think we'll be on the same page. Isn't it possible for the ideal you've just described to coexist with the ideal of meritocracy? Couldn't unionization, healthcare, education, daycare, all of these things give the underclass the dignity that you are prescribing uh, without throwing the baby of meritocracy out with the bathwater of injustice. What I want to throw out is not removing barriers so that everyone can uh, apply to university, for example. And I certainly don't want to discourage people from uh, in, uh, applying to university. That's a good thing in and of itself. What I do want to throw out or question, Shashi, is the notion of moral deservingness that goes with landing on top. That's what triggers the dark side of meritocracy because that means that even the generous meritocrats whom you described will come to see their responsibility, our responsibility, to the less well-off as helping them, helping them, but from our perch on high, 
okay. and helping them in a spirit of hubris, but yes, we earned it, we deserve it, we belong on top, but they're struggling, so surely we can show some generosity toward them. I want to, what I do want to th throw out or question that is, has become central to the meritocratic project is this sense of inhaling the success, tendency of the successful to inhale too deeply of our success, to forget the role of luck and good fortune that helped us on our way. If I could add one thing in, in support of this idea, see, I think this sense of entitlement is deeply connected to meritocracy. The term was coined, meritocracy, in 1958 by Michael Young, a British sociologist, who did not coin meritocracy as an ideal. He saw it as a dystopian scenario because he glimpsed that once we remove barriers to achievement, which is a good and important thing, there would be a tendency for the winners to believe that their success was their due. And even if they managed nonetheless to be generous, it would be in a spirit of looking down. And I guess what I'm trying to challenge is this spirit of looking down, Shashi. Okay, but then, I mean, and I, I, I totally accept, uh, I accept you're coming from the right place. And in fact, your, your last section talks about how important humility is as a civic virtue, right. uh, as an antidote to this meritocratic hubris you talk about. But let's say everybody who's listened to you is totally convinced by your argument and they ask themselves, well, how do we now act on it? And that becomes a challenge because it's not an option, is it, for an individual to opt out of the tyranny of merit because that individual will simply lose out to all the others who are racing ahead the up the meritocratic ladder. Surely the flaw, if you like, in applying the Sandel thesis on merit is that your conclusions only work if the entire society adopts them in toto, because an individual can't suddenly become, uh, shall we say, committed to the common good and abandon meritocracy if everyone around him is actually thriving through yes, the meritocratic right. system. You're, you're right, Shashi. It's, it's not only or mainly something that we can do individually at home, so to speak. That's it right. requires, and what the book aims at, is changing the terms of our politics, changing the way we conceive society and the economy. We assume, we too readily assume, that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good. But this is a mistake. We have out, and we spoke about hedge fund managers who illustrate how untrue this can be. We, we have outsourced our moral judgment about what counts as a valuable contribution to the common good, to markets. I think we need to reclaim it as democratic citizens. You're right. This can't be an individual project. What I'm suggesting, to go back to the image of the latter, is apart from the project of enabling anyone, regardless of background, to compete to scramble up the ladder of success, we need to do two other things. We need to notice that the rungs on the ladder have been growing further and further apart. The ladder has become steeper, and that's not a good thing. And we need to question the assumption that the main, uh, the, that the main purpose of politics or of progressive politics is to provide a fairer scramble up the ladder and ask whether that scramble, sponsoring, encouraging, cultivating that sense of competition and scramble up the ladder, that divide between winners and losers isn't at odds with cultivating a sense of a shared common life, a sense of solidarity, a sense of responsibility for one another that arises when we notice that even though we succeed, our success is the result of all sorts of uh, of, of luck, good fortune, and indebtedness for which we individually can claim no credit. So that's the humility that can underwrite a public ethic. You're right, it can't just be individual. A public ethic, a turning to recognize the sense in which we share responsibility for one another in a democratic society and that democracy can only flourish 
if we cultivate a common life rather than he's the way to enable those who are capable of scrambling up a ladder, even as the rungs on the ladder grow further and further apart. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, well, to end this fabulous conversation, I should tell, the, tell you for the Indian readers and listeners benefit that we are now in the cricket season in India and the great story of Indian cricket in the last generation has been the meritocracy of the, the brilliant young players from small town India, unfashionable parts of the country, uh, really poor backgrounds and so on, who through sheer cricketing merit have broken into the national team, have transformed um, and democratized, as many would see it, uh, what used to be seen as a very elitist sport and through meritocracy have risen to the top of Indian cricket. And it's particularly interesting because in your closing section, you talk about Hank Aaron, the black baseball player who grew up in the segregated South, broke Babe Ruth's famous record for career home runs. And that was described by many, including his own biographer, as the, the real meritocracy in his life. Mm -hmm. That in right. you say, it's a wrong lesson to draw because the moral of his story is not that we should love meritocracy, but that we should despise a system of injustice that can only be escaped by hitting home runs. Wow. Now, that's, that's a tough statement. And Indian cricket fans will be left scratching their heads about it. But let me end by also quoting you on the English Christian socialist R.H. Tawney, who clearly has inspired uh, some part of your vision of a, of a just society, because you argue, quoting Tawney, that the alternative to equality of opportunity is a broad democratic equality of condition that enables people of all walks of life to see themselves as participants in a common venture. Uh, it's an ideal. I hope it turns out to be a realizable ideal. Uh, and that, Michael, uh, has, uh, has been your great contribution to help us think beyond uh, the corrosion of our civic sensibilities through the pursuit of success with the excuse of meritocracy uh, and, and to enable us, therefore, to come right down to this question of how do we ensure in our societies an equality of condition. I'll leave you the last word before handing you back to the organizers. So my last word would be this. First, to thank you for this strenuous and generous challenge and conversation, Shashi. And to suggest, uh, here would be my final thought, that we often think that the opposite of meritocracy is aristocracy or caste. But what I'm trying to suggest is that the opposite of meritocracy, of course, meritocracy represents an advance over aristocratic caste privilege. But today, when meritocracy becomes linked up with a competitive market society, the real alternative to meritocracy is democracy. But I wanna thank you for really a generous and demanding in the best sense of uh, conversation and exchange from which I have learned a lot as I always do, Shashi. Um, it brings back memories of our seminars together many years ago. And so thank you so much for this and for everything you're, you're doing both in, in the world of thought and letters and in the world of politics. Thank you so much, Michael. In fact, your last comment made me think how interesting it would be if you were to talk about this book in China, where they claim to be committed to the common good and equally committed to meritocracy in determining that common good. It would make for a stimulating uh, conversation there, except I'm not sure their society is free enough to permit one along the lines we've just had. Thank you again, Michael Sandel. I, I cannot recommend this book highly enough I'm sorry if in this light uh, you can't see it very clearly. The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good? Michael J. Sandel, my good friend, and back to JLF organizers. Thank you, Michael Sandel. Thank you, Shashi Tharoor, for throwing light on the profound implications of polarized politics and a polarized world, especially in today's very difficult times. We thank our media partners, Mr. Standard, and our celebration partner, Diashio. Thanks for watching and being such a great audience. Please do remember to stay locked on or visit us again and catch some of the sessions at the Darbar Hall 
where we have a list of stellar speakers from across the world. As you're aware, we at the cultural sector has been critically impacted by the pandemic. We'd love you to support us by pressing contribute. Do remember also to visit Amazon online, our bookstore, and of course, our arts and crafts store, Earth Fables. Remember to tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2021, and our handles are at Jaipur Lit Fest. The festival is protected by Dettol. Stay safe, stay masked. Thank you. Thank you.